Morning. Morning. Today I had to ask. I had to ask for directions how to get here because <laughs> it's been so long. Uh, didn't expect to be gone as long as I was. Um, uh, for those of you who I'm sure everybody is aware, uh, my mom. Uh, I think I got a little ring in, 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 ringing in my ears. Uh, uh, last week, my mom left this earth and went to be with Jesus. And so today is a resurrection day that is uh, very important and special to me. Uh, Each time it should be, but I think with the passing of my mom, uh, it's a little little more uh, intense, close to my chest. I do want to thank everyone for the the cards. I got like a stack of cards at home. All of the uh, prayers on Facebook and the, the things that you did and the food that was brought and the kind words and the uh, helping with our expenses uh, from our benevolence fund helped us to make that trip. And then there was a group of people that sent us uh, money as well. And I just was overwhelmed by your love and your appreciation. And I, I, I know sometimes pastors feel like, well, when they're gone, everyone's saying, well, they're not doing their job. They're not here. I never felt that one time. Because I knew, first of all, these brothers had it in order. I, I, I watched them on, on the videos, and I saw they brought the heat, and they brought the truth. But you guys were so uh, generous to give me that time to be with my family. Um, uh, the Saturday before we went, I was on my lawnmower praying and asking God what I should do. That's my, that's my prayer closet is my lawnmower. The yard, beat, the yard beats me to death because there's so many bumps. And I have a lot of I have a lot of hard conversations with God, and I, I just didn't know what to do. And uh, at the end of the mowing, uh, I got off the mower and I went inside. I said, "We got to go." I don't know why. We got to go. And I, my my biggest concern was my mom was just she was so healthy that her body just wouldn't quit. And so you know I didn't know if we'd fly down there and she'd live for another three weeks. You know nobody knows that kind of stuff. We, I wish God had give me that timeline, but He didn't. And uh, so we went with an open-ended ticket, which was my wife's genius idea. I'm like, man, I didn't even think about that. Just let's fly down and we'll figure it out. And uh, I got to be there and got some closure that I didn't think I needed. I thought I spent time with her in October, that all, all was well. She knew me then, and she wouldn't even know I was there, but yet she did. And so uh, I am so thankful that God uh, gave me the wisdom. Excuse me. God gave my wife the wisdom. <laughs> for us to make that trip. So I do want to thank you. Well, it's Resurrection Sunday. I know if you didn't realize that, that's what today's all about. All across this world, people are gathering. Folks are attending church with their families. And it may be a time for a, you got a ham in the oven and you're getting ready to, when you leave here, you've got family all coming together. And, and those are great times. We spent time at the lake yesterday just sitting around and loving on each other and playing go- uh, goofy golf or whatever uh, putt putt and just enjoying time with the kids it's it's a great time families get together and they celebrate around easter but sometimes i f- i feel like we 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 miss the point we get together and we have family time and we eat and we 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 sit back and enjoy this beautiful weather that we're having but Have we missed the point of why we gather around the Easter celebration? You see, several thousands of years ago, an event took place, and we think of it as this magnanimous event that the whole world knew about, but that's not the case. There was a lot of confusion and despair that surrounded this event that happened on Good Friday. And the Savior of the world was crucified. And so you kind of get that feel from the text in John chapter 20 where it says, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. And she saw that the stone had been removed or lifted out of the groove across the entrance of the tomb. See, nobody knew it. Nobody really knew saw it. It wasn't this huge event that made CNN and Fox News. Nobody knew about it except for a few people. So she ran 
And she went to Simon Peter and the other disciples whom the Lord tenderly loved and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have laid him. They saw the emptiness of that tomb and it distressed them. It caused despair and confusion and fear because the body of the one they loved so much was gone. And so the emptiness of that tomb brought despair and confusion. In our culture, Emptiness is usually a negative thing. It's a negative thing. If your wallet is empty, it means you have grandkids and they've taken it all. And your kids are like, where were you when I was growing up? But sometimes an empty wallet brings stress and depression and fear. Or an empty mailbox means there's no one corresponding or maybe your inbox and your email is quiet. Nobody's talking. Maybe there's an empty place in the bed next to you where your loved one is no longer there. Or as a result of a divorce or a death, there's an empty chair in the house where once was life. It seems like it's all gone. You see, our mindset sees empty as a negative. But this morning, I'm here to tell you that Jesus changes the rules as He always does. And He turns the table. He flips the meaning of emptiness today. You see, the empty tomb means newness. It means a new way of life. I believe that the tomb that the tomb of Christ is famous because of what it does not contain. The tomb of Christ is famous worldwide because of what isn't there. And that is a body, particularly the body of Christ. The significance of that tomb was that when the women arrived, it was empty. It was empty. The definition of empty is containing nothing, having none of the usual or appropriate contents. What was supposed to be in that grave? All the other tombs in the land. What were in those tombs? Dead bodies. Decaying flesh. Bodies of loved ones who had gone on and died. Except this morning, There wasn't a body. As usual, the appropriate contents for a tomb is a body, which is the crux of Christianity, mind you. You know that, right? The most important message that we as Christians have is that the tomb was empty and Christ was alive, and that changes everything. So, This Easter morning, I would like for us to consider how Jesus redefines emptiness. And where you may be feeling some emptiness in your life, He wants to fill that emptiness with His presence. So today, let's consider how the empty tomb makes all the difference in the world. There in your outline, it says, So the emptiness of the tomb reminds us that God makes a way for us to first of all have a new relationship with Him. The emptiness of that tomb, that barren tomb, the tomb that Mary, the Marys expected a dead body to be in so that they could prepare that body and wrap it. 
It, was there. it wasn't there. And this empty tomb reminds us that God gives us a new relationship with Him. You see, our old relationship with God was severed. It was severed because of our sin. Mankind chose to rebel against God over and above obedience to God. We chose our own way over and above God's love. Therefore, we have a gap between us and God. Then Jesus came. He lived a sinless life. He died a selfless death. And now He is raised back to life and He makes a way for us to be in an intimate relationship and a friendship with God. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6 that if we have become one with Him by sharing a death like His, we also shall be one with Him in sharing His resurrection. By a new life lived for God. You see, the old way that I used to live brought me nothing but grief and heartache. I thought it was a good thing. But that old way of life was self-centered. It was, it was all about Ed. When Jesus came on the scene, when I experienced the resurrection life that Jesus brings, now I have a new way of life. A new relationship with God. Him. So our relationship with God begins with the death of Christ and it is accomplished by the resurrection of Christ. In 1 Peter, it says, Praised, honored be the God of our God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ the Messiah. By his boundless mercy, we have been born again into an ever living hope. Through what? The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So, it was the resurrection of Jesus that literally paved the way for us to start a new relationship with Him. Sin had driven a wedge between us and a holy God could not look upon the lives that are filled with sin. Yet the gap was closed by Jesus' death and burial and resurrection. And so that new relationship that you and I can have with God now gives us a reason, number two, to rejoice in Him. It gives us a new sense of what it means to rejoice. I know that a very popular song came out. I guess it was last year. I think it was the happy song. Right? I mean, after a while, it's kind of like John Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt. Remember that one? There's just no end to the song. Okay, we get it, Pharrell. You're happy. A room without a roof. Don't understand that one. That means you're going to get wet if it rains and it's cold. But for him, that makes him happy. But really, we can sing about happiness all day long. But does that really make us happy? You can eat. Hey, I had kids, and even back then they had Happy Meals. And they used to eat Happy Meals, and it never made them happy because they didn't want the toy that was in the box. Right? You don't get to pick that toy. You do get boy or girl, but nowadays, you, you know, it's a toss-up. You can eat as many Happy Meals as you want, but it doesn't necessarily gain and mean you're going to be happy. So many people are looking for happiness and they aren't finding it in things. They aren't finding it in relationships. They're not finding it in their jobs. They're not finding it in their money or any of those things make them happy. Those new shoes, you just your Easter Sunday go to meet and shoes that you just bought, I promise you, they won't make you happy because they're probably hurting your feet right now. But you're saying to yourself, I love my new shoes. They look so good, but they're hurting my feet. It seems like nobody's happy anymore. 
There's just so many bad things happening in this world. And that bad news breeds fear and confusion, creating hopelessness and despair. Remember the disciples before the resurrection. They were a messed up bunch, weren't they? Couldn't get it right. One wanted to be at the right hand. The other one wanted to sit on the other hand. They were arguing for position and power. They were bickering. But after the resurrection, everything changed, didn't it? Everything changed. Even though they were being persecuted, as you read in the, later on in the, in the New Testament, and all the troubles in the temptation and the trials that they faced and the persecution those brothers said they they even wrote things like i rejoice even though i'm being persecuted where was that kind of language before jesus came before the resurrection you don't hear that kind of language because they were convinced that jesus was alive and god gave them a new Way to rejoice. In Revelation 20, John says these words, Blessed, happy to be envied, and holy that is spiritually whole and unimpaired innocence and proved virtue is the person who takes part in the first resurrection. You want happiness? Happiness is found in the resurrection. Happiness is found in the new life that Jesus gives as He overcame death, hell, and the grave. John Piper said it like this, The best news of the Christian Gospel is that the supremely glorious Creator of the universe has acted in Jesus Christ's death and resurrection to remove every obstacle between us and Himself so that we may find everlasting joy in seeing and savoring His infinite beauty. If you want to know the truth, if you want to know what it's like to live a life full of joy in the midst of the heartache and the depression and all the bad news and all the bad things that are happening in this world, God says you'll find it in the resurrection. Because the resurrection is much like a really good family reunion where you are apart for a season and when you come back together, you see one another again. That's the hope that I have for my mom and my dad. I had somebody come up to me and go, how does it feel to be an orphan? I didn't even think about it that way. I started getting down. But then I remembered the resurrection is coming. And I remembered one day I'm going to see my mom. My mom and dad had been apart for 25 years. I knew my dad wasn't coming back. And I could just see my dad in heaven tugging on Jesus' robe. Is it today? Is she coming today? Easy, Nick. She's coming. Just chill. Chill. And I could just see him standing there waiting on my mom. And I don't know how that works in heaven, but I'm sure they did a little salsa because they love to dance the salsa dance. You see, the resurrection re reminds us that it's a new relationship that we have with God, a relationship that it's alive and vibrant and full of hope for the future and not dread of the future. If you look around us in this world, there's a lot of dread and fear. But the resurrection promises us a, a new hope. Every one of us wants to be happy. Even our Declaration of Independence says we have the right to pursue happiness, right? But every, every effort I made to pursue happiness before I met Jesus fell. It actually fell into addiction until I met the one who set me free. I believe that the resurrection of Jesus promises a hope and a future. It provides a reason to rejoice. For Jesus has risen just as He promised. In Matthew's account of the resurrection, it says that Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, they went to watch over the tomb. And it says that the, suddenly the ground shook violently. 
and the stone rolled away and they saw shafts of lightning and an angel appeared. It was epic. It was something right out of a Hollywood movie. The soldiers guarding the tomb fell as if they were dead men. And an angel told the women, there's nothing to fear. You're looking for Jesus. He's not here. He's risen. Just as he said. Now go tell your friends. Go tell the brothers. I know they won't believe, but go tell them. And it says the women, deep in wonder and full of joy, lost no time leaving the tomb. And they ran to tell the others. And as a result of this new rejoicing, God gives us a means to a new reconciliation. A new reconciliation. The fact that we needed to be reconciled means that our relationship with God was broken. And since God is holy, we are the ones to blame. Our sin alienated us from Him, making us enemies of God. Thus, Romans 5.10 reminds us that while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. It is much more certain now that we are reconciled, that we shall be saved, daily delivered from sin's dominion through His resurrection life. You see, when Christ died on the cross, He was raised to life. He satisfied God's judgment and He made it possible for us, God's enemies, to find peace with Him. So it is our reconciliation to God then that involves the exercise of His grace and the forgiveness of our sin. So the result of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is that our relationship has changed from hostility to friendship. In fact, it is Jesus who said, I no longer call you servants. I call you friends. You're a friend of God. The creator of the universe calls us his friend. Paul told the Colossian church, that through Jesus, God reconciled everything to Himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. You see, the resurrection of Christ provides us with a new relationship with God. We're no longer His enemies. He calls us His friends which gives us, next, a new kind of resolve about us. I become more resolute about my relationship with Him as a result of the resurrection. The resurrection will give us a firm purpose, no matter what. You see, God knew that these ragtag bunch of followers that were hanging on for dear life. After Jesus died, they scattered. One ran, threw his clothes off and ran. His closest friend denied him in the garden, right? The courtyard. He knew they needed more. And it was a result of the resurrection of Christ that God gave this ragtag bunch of followers, a new resolve. It's what helped them to remember and to rehearse and to write down the things that they'd seen, the things that they had heard, the things that they had experienced with Jesus so accurately that we hold them now as the Gospels. It was that resurrection power that gave them the courage to be Resolve about their faith no matter what, at all costs. It wasn't until Paul, the apostle, came face to face with the risen Savior on the road to Damascus. Remember that? It wasn't until then that he found the resolve that he needed even to write letters, precious letters, powerful letters 
from a, a prison cell, sometimes even chained to a dead body. It was that resurrection power that enabled Paul to write some incredible words like he did to the Philippian church. Listen to this resolve that God gave him in the midst of his trials. For my determined purpose is that I might know him. Wow. That I may progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him that I may perceive and recognize and understand the wonders of His person more strongly and more clearly. That I may have in the same way come to know the power outflowing from His resurrection, which exerts over believers. And that I may so share His sufferings as to be continually transformed in spirit into his likeness, even to his death in the hope. Listen to that resolve. That resolve didn't happen because some one day Paul said, you know what, doggone it, I'm going to live for God. How many of us have tried that? How many resol- New Year's resolutions have we made? How many promises, okay, to God, today I'm going to walk with you and I'm going to serve you because I can do this. How old does that go for you? I didn't think so either. And yet Paul says, because of that resurrection power, which gives us the energy and gives us the enthusiasm and gives us the power to do that which we could not do without it. Paul knew that his resolve came because he knew Christ in his death and his resurrection. Pastor and author John Ortberg wrote this, At the heart of the Christian faith is the story of Jesus' death and resurrection. It's the one part of our story that delineates us from all other religions. is the death and the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. It must be the central focus of every effort of the church. Anytime you and I share the gospel, share our testimony, share hope with someone who does not know him yet, the death and the resurrection of Christ must be the central focus. Because that is the power that saves us. Listen to Paul's resolve in his letter to the Ephesians. This is incredibly important for us today. Paul says, Let them see the full extent of your power that is at work in those of us who believe. And may it be done according to your might and power. Friends, it is this same might and resurrection power that he used in the Anointed One to raise him from the dead and to position him at his right hand in heaven. And he says there is nothing over him. He is above all, uh, above all rule and authority and power and dominion over every name evoked, over every title bestowed in this age and the next. God has placed all things beneath his feet and anointed him as, as the head over all things for his church. And as a result of Christ coming back to life, we too now have a resurrection life. You and I now have a new resurrection. He shares that resurrection power with us. On that Wednesday afternoon, my wife and I were on our way back to my mom's. We were staying with my sisters about. 30 minutes away, and we got a text. It's getting close. Well, we'd been getting those texts all week. And her blood pressure would begin to drop, and her oxygen levels would begin to drop, and, and her fingers would start to turn dark, and those are all the signs. And all the, they had nurses there 24 hours a day. This was at my sister's house where my mom was living. But every day I'd get there, and 
My mom would they'd say, well, their blood pressure is better than mine. And all the color's right. And her oxygen, her pulse ox is back to normal. And I told them I know what it is. My mom, in her final years, did not like to be told what to do. So all of my brothers and sisters are whispering here, here, Mom, it's okay. Go be with Jesus. Go, they're waiting. Jesus and Dad are waiting. And she, I could just hear her. I know going now. I going to wait. You don't tell me. You don't tell me. I could just hear her saying that. So I was like, let's reverse this thing. Mom, stay. (laughs) So we get that call, and so we get there, and sure enough, her she's just kind of hanging on. She had no cancer, she had no illness. She was just just aged and ready to go. But her body just kept on working. So we're all gathered there and kind of, I was actually sitting there at the, at the uh, desk at my mom's, her bed was here and I was working on her, uh, the slideshow that we were going to do for her service. And my sister and I were talking about one of the pictures and should we do this, should we do that with it. All of a sudden the nurse said, hey guys, it's time. And so we turned around And I stood there, and we all just put our hands on her. (laughs) And she breathed her last breath. And so for just a moment, I felt that emptiness. That my mom's no longer there. I can't FaceTime her and sing to her and all the things that I used to do, living so far away from her. But in the moment that I felt that despair in my heart, I felt an incredible excitement. Because my mom left a place surrounded by people that she loved, and now she's with Jesus, the ultimate resurrection. So as a Christian, when my mom knelt on her knees on the floor in the midst of about 100 students at a youth rally that I was doing, she had just come to hang out with us and stay with us for about six weeks. And so I'm doing this youth event. Whatever we did, she did. So all my students loved my mom. Because she was there uh, giving them pizza and drinks after the service. And so I'm there at this youth rally, and we've got hundreds of kids in this room, and they're, they preach the message, and they're all, uh, kids are coming forward and accepting Jesus, and I'm down there praying with them and counseling with them, and one of the guys taps me on the shoulder. He says, look! And in the middle of all those kids is my little gray-haired mom on her knees. Because several years before that, My dad died, and my mom said, I'm mad at God. He took my Nikki. And so for all those years, she said, I don't talk to God. He don't love me. And so I I, I stood her up, and she said, I'm not mad at God anymore. (laughs) And that night, we came up on stage, and my mom accepted Jesus as her Lord and her Savior. So that moment, when she drew her last breath, She woke up face to face with the Savior of the world who took her by the hand and said, Neela, there's your husband. Welcome to heaven, my good and faithful servant. You see, in Christ, the resurrection promises us a new resurrection. Not just the resurrection of Christ, but he also applies that resurrection to us. You see, while the emptiness of the tomb initially brought question and confusion as the women arrived there, they saw that the body had been removed and they didn't know what happened. Jesus' resurrection, that emptiness of that tomb, makes it possible for you and I to experience a new resurrection. Earlier in John's Gospel, Jesus reminds this of his friends Mary and Martha. In John 11, Jesus said to them, I am myself the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes in me, adheres to and trusts and relies on me, although they may die, you shall live. That is the hope of a Christian. That even though my body will decay, even though my life will end, 
I will live forever because of Jesus. So Jesus leads the way once again. He says, you believe and you trust in me. You trust in my resurrection and my resurrection becomes your resurrection. That's good news. That's the good news of the gospel. I don't know what emptiness you brought in here today. I I don't know what's going on inside of you. I don't know what you've been walking in this week. Maybe it's the loss of a loved one. And you struggle with that. And now there's an empty room or an empty place at the table or an empty place in your bed. Maybe it's a res- uh, the result of a divorce, which is the death of a marriage. Maybe it's the loss of a job. Maybe you feel lonely and depressed. Maybe your soul feels empty and dry. Well, today on Resurrection Sunday, this empty tomb will bring fullness and wholeness again. I'd like to invite the worship team. As we end this service today, whether you've been coming to this church on a regular basis, or maybe this is your first time, and you're here with a friend, or you're here with a a loved one, I'd like to invite you to experience the resurrection power that can only come from Jesus. He offers us a new life. He offers us a new hope. He offers us a new relationship. He offers us a new reconciliation. The old has passed. The new has come. Jesus says, I will bring new life. I will give you hope. I will give you a table in the wilderness. I will give you strength when you find yourself weak. The resurrection isn't just something that happened over 2,000 years ago. No, no. The resurrection is something for us here and now. In our present day. Bringing us hope. Bringing us grace. And bringing us love. Let's bow our heads this morning. Father, today, We ask you, God, to give us hope in a hopeless world. God, give us strength. Give us a sense of understanding that you are present with us right here, right now. That over and above all of our troubles, over and above all of our strife, over and above all the things that we have going on in our lives, over and above all the emptiness that we feel in our hearts, God, that you would give us hope. Hope in the resurrection. Hope in the fact that Jesus Christ is no longer in the tomb. But that He's risen. That He is risen right now. That that resurrection is not just an old story that we once knew. But that it's for right here and right now. As the worship team plays, I invite you to consider the new life that Jesus wants to give us. That the resurrection is alive for you today. Won't you receive Jesus and begin to experience the fullness that He longs to give you?